Frankfurt. Uh, if I haven't had the privilege of meeting you, my name is Darren, one of the pastors here at Coomera Baptist Church. And as the kids are in service, um, they can have they can make noise and we'll be okay. So I'll um, I'll let you know if it's too much, but you can they can hang out and, and craft and and all bits and pieces. But there is a there is a um, room one if you want to take them to their um, if things are you know they're throwing pens at each other as I has or something. Let's uh, on that note let's pray um, that the Lord would be amongst us this morning. Our oh, good and gracious God, we are glad to be gathered here today, and we are glad that you've given us your word. We are glad, Father, that you've given us your Son, Jesus Christ, and we're glad that you've given us your Spirit. Would you reveal truth to us through your word today? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I remember towards the end of high school, um, this might be a familiar experience to some of you, sitting in the uh, career officer's room, and they would be asking you questions, talking, trying to think through what are you going to do after school. Uh, they'd ask that open-ended question, so Darren, uh, where, do, where do you see yourself after school? Uh, my immediate thought that ran into my mind was, was that I'd, well, I'd normally see myself in mirrors or, um, or in, you know, reflections on glass, but they were after something a little more richer and meaningful. And uh, my answer to them was, I don't really know. Uh, I like biology, um, so I don't like kind of exercise, maybe like physiotherapy or something. That seemed like a, a, a prospect. Um, they thought, are you, what are you good at? And I'm like, not heaps. Um, what do you like? And I was thought, well, I like music. Um, okay, well, that's, can you play? I'm like, no. So I'm like, all right. So we were, it was a really encouraging time. Um, but it's an important question in one sense that I think every person who's gone through high school has had that pr- pressure question of, um, where do you see yourself after school? And of course, the after school happens and you get a job, or you go and study, um, and then somewhere maybe in your early 20s, you ask the question again, um, hey, where do you see yourself, you know, 10 years from now? So, now the stakes are a little bit higher, you feel like, okay, well, we're not at school anymore. Some people usually have a vision of something that's maybe better than where they're currently at, and then The 10 years pass, and then maybe you're in that spot that you thought you saw yourself being in, and if we were to take a poll in the room and raise the hands, how many of you were in the spot that you thought you'd see yourself in, not many people's hands would probably go up. What happens if we stretch it out a little longer? We don't say, hey, the next 10 years. What if we ask the question, where do you see yourself after you die? Where do you see yourself after you die? It's all coming for us at one time or another. And it's, an inquest- it's a question that the career counselors don't usually ask. And it's a question that schools don't usually ask. And it's probably a question that you haven't heard or asked out there in the world. Where do you see yourself after you die? Well, the passage before us today has some good news for us. Because in this passage, we see Jesus praying for His people and exactly where He sees them after they pass from this life to the next. Look with me there at the end in verse 24. It says, Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Where do you see yourself after you die? Well, if you're in Christ, Jesus sees you with Him. This is the eternal glorious future that awaits those in Christ. It's to experience the glory of Christ, this kind of love that He says was His before, that the Father had for the Son from eternity past. He says, I see you being with me for, for all eternity. This is, this is so glorious that it's going to take an eternity to comprehend it. The, this glory of Christ that we will get to see one day is so glorious that it's, it's veiled now in this world. You, you can't fully see it yet because it's too glorious to comprehend. We're not ready for it. It's glorious, so glorious that angels and heavenly creatures are bowing down in unceasing worship of the, the Lamb upon the throne. This is so glorious that it forms Jesus' final petition from Him to the Father. 
He's been praying for his disciples, the ones that he's been with the last three years, that they would be set apart as one, that they would be sanctified, that they'd be sent out on mission. And at the end, it's culminating this prayer, and he's saying, Father, I long for all who believe in their word to be with me to see my glory. That's how the story ends. That's the pinnacle. Jesus sees himself with us. So where do you see yourself after you die? By God's grace, you'll see yourself with Jesus, seeing his glory. And so how is he going to get his people there? How is he going to get his people there to be with him, seeing his glory for all eternity? Well, I think two things come out in this passage. There are more things, but two things come out in this passage that Jesus is praying for that will get his people to there to see his glory. He's praying for their oneness, and he's praying for their witness. He's praying for their oneness, that they may be one as he and the Father are one, and that oneness is for the sake of witness, for the sake of mission, that people would come to know him. You, you can see that, can't you, in verse 21, 20 to 21, and then it repeats again in 22 to 23. So look with me in 20 to 21. It says, I do not ask for these only, that is, his immediate disciples, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. And again, in verse 22, we see the glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one. Why? So that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you love me. So, so you see the movement in Jesus' prayer? He's praying for oneness, for the sake of witness, and that witness sees more people come into believing the gospel and so more people with Jesus glorifying him for all eternity. So look, look firstly with me at what this oneness that he's praying for is founded upon. And then we'll look at the oneness, what it flows out to, which is witness. So firstly, we see that this oneness is founded upon the Word, the Word of the Apostles. Jesus is now praying for all those who will believe in Him through the Word of the Apostles. He's been praying for His current disciples, but as these current disciples get out there on mission, what starts to happen? They start preaching, proclaiming the gospel. People are hearing the news of the resurrected Jesus, and people are becoming Christians. They're believing, and as they believe, they become one. This, this oneness is, the, is, the, this is the, the foundation of their oneness is the apostles' word, the finished work of Christ, the message of the person of Jesus. They've risen from the dead. That's what creates their oneness. You notice the, the oneness in the church here isn't built upon um, common objectives to make the world a nicer place, though that is good. The oneness is, is not built upon um, ultimately ex like particular doctrinal practices, though that is necessary for churches to function and exist. You notice their oneness isn't kind of what they stand against. Rather, their oneness here is oneness that is created supernaturally by the word of the apostles, by the message of the gospel. Doctrinal fidelity. You see, only the true message of the gospel will truly make people one in Christ. False gospel doesn't unite people truly together. The true gospel does. True words, bringing people together. Those who would believe in me through their word, that is what their unity is founded upon. And it's a true revelation that we see in verse 22, a revelation of the glory of God. That, that's what the Father gave the Son and the Son gave to the apostles. That's what the glory is in verse 22. It says, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. What was the glory that was given to Jesus? Jesus was given the glorious task of revealing the Father, of making him known to the world. Through his message, he taught the truths concerning who the Father was and the way of salvation. So Jesus is revealing the Father's plans. He's revealing the Father's works. He's revealing the Father's glory. Now, this same glory that was given to Jesus is given to the church, his people. Go out and make the name of Jesus known. 
Make the name of the Father known. Let that glory go out and radiate out amongst you. And it makes us one. How does it make us one? How does the message kind of bring us all together? Well, the, the gospel message does that by, by breaking down the, the walls of hostility that exist between humanity. By default, human beings from different backgrounds, places, and preferences don't all get along. We have countries. We have states within countries. We lock our doors. We, we have a tendency to squabble, to fight, to bicker, to pull apart. Divisiveness. It's there at every level of society. At school, it's the, the cool kids separate from the uncool kids. And 20 years later, it's the uncool kids of the cool kids, and the cool kids are no longer the cool kids. Maybe it's racial divides. Maybe it's social status or, uh, or e economic um, privileges. Society has a lent and a bent towards what? Division. It's not oneness. And then when society does try to build towards oneness in, in Project Babylon, it doesn't do so with the sake of God in the picture. It tries to build a oneness, a greatness without God, which ultimately, as the Bible shows us, leads to death. But what you have in the gospel message, the words of the apostles coming to people, and they believe it. Do you know what it says? It says, we are all sinners who've been offered the free gift of salvation. Come and receive. And as we receive that, we enter into His family. We get brothers and sisters with the one God as our Father. That brings us, out, us together as one. The broken wall hostility, the wall has been broken down. We can be united now as one in Christ still having our distinctions as people and backgrounds and groups, but united together under the banner of Christ. That's the foundation of church throughout history. That's the foundation that we here, hearing the gospel some 2,000 years, believe in. What we read earlier in the Nicene Creed. What unites us to one another is the Word of God, the true message of what the apostles taught. This is how Jesus kind of founds the, the oneness. This is what he anchors it in, in the church. We were at a um, regional gathering this week, the, the pastors here, for the Fellowship of Independent Evangelical Churches. And at this regional gathering that we were gathered in, uh, the question was looking at Matthew 16 and Jesus building his church. And the question was raised, how does Jesus build his church? And then our little table, we're talking about this and discussing and, 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 and rec recognizing and realizing the way that Jesus is building His church. And it's not on marketing. It's not on cool programs. It's not on charismatic leaders. It's on the revelation of truth. Who is Jesus? Who do you say I am? Jesus says to Peter, He says, you are the Son of God. Right confession. A right confessor. The Word of God creates the people of God, bringing them, uniting them together. Church unity is not by being close in age. Church unity won't happen by gathering around similar preferences, by being close to Jesus, by believing in His message. That's actually what you've got in common with the people to your left and to your right. And that's what you've got in common with the saints over in Bangladesh or Iraq or Botswana. You share belief in the same message. You share a same Savior. And that Savior unites His people, makes them one. And so the more you move towards the true revelation of who Jesus is, do you know what will happen? The more you ought to move towards the people of God. Think of it, I think one pastor said, it's like an inverted cone. The more you're moving up towards Jesus as the pinnacle, the closer and closer you get to God's people. And that's the trajectory of history, isn't it? For eternity. We're all going to be in the same place together one day. All united. They're moving closer. And so there's a oneness that happens amongst us as we all move towards the truer, walking the true revelation of who Jesus is. Now, what is the nature of this oneness? Because Jesus is clear here. He doesn't leave it too open-ended, but actually he brings you into what he sees as oneness and the closeness of it. He says in verse 21, he's praying that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us. So Jesus is praying 
for is believers. All those who would believe that they might know and have the kind of closeness that the Father has with the Son. Jesus is praying and he's petitioning the Father that the church throughout all the ages would experience the kind of closeness and unity that the Father shares with the Son. That's a close unity, isn't it? That's a kind of togetherness, a oneness that isn't torn apart. If our oneness is to be analogous to the way the Father and the Son are one, it begs the question, in what way are the Father and the Son one? Jesus' ministry kind of made a lot of this clear. He says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The Father's doing his works through the Son. He's saying his words are the Father's words. So there's a oneness in word and action. In the same way, I think the church shares the same words, the message of the gospel, the the finished work of Jesus. And we share the same works to make disciples of all nations. And that's true, as you mentioned, in churches in India and Philippines or in Scotland. Same message, same manner. But the, but, but it's, it's deeper than that, isn't it? It's, it's not just kind of practical things that we share. It's a, that message and that manner is actually a deeper because we are a one in, in a sense of being. There's a kind of togetherness that happens to the church. Father and Son are one in will and desire and affection, seeking to glorify God together. All this was, was, you know, for the church, this is created by the Word of God in us. It takes divided people and it makes them spiritual brothers and sisters. We are one. We are one like them. That's what Jesus is praying for. He doesn't just pray that they would be like them, but that they would also be in them. Did you see that in verse, in the, at the end of verse 21? That they may also be in us. So it isn't to, to pull, if life was a road trip, Jesus isn't just saying, I hope they all get along in the minivan together. As if the Christians and the churches in a minivan all getting along, Jesus and the Father and the Spirit are another minivan all getting along. He's actually praying that they'll jump in the minivan with the Godhead himself. You see that? I want them to be one just as we are one, that they also may be in us. Jesus saying, I want these people to come share in what we have. It's that good. There are, of course, limits to this. We are made in the image of God, but we don't share in the divine essence of God. So we don't become little gods, to be clear. But we do get to share in the relational proximity to God. God the Father and God the Son through God the Holy Spirit. And of course, it's God the Holy Spirit. That's the answer to this prayer, isn't it? That's, that's the kind of the means through which we share in this oneness. It's, it's the way it comes about and happens. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ who will be sent by Christ to dwell in the people of Christ so that they may know the words of Christ and receive the help of Christ. He is the Holy Spirit. He's the one who will continue to make known the person of Christ, even as the person of Christ is not longer in this world, verse 25. He's the answer to the prayer that Jesus is praying. The Holy Spirit would be amongst us. Jesus is saying, come on in the minivan with me. Come and share in this relationship. Come partake in us. Be swept up into Him and His love. Now, though we are swept up into it, it doesn't mean we've reached its final stage. It doesn't mean that being swept up into the unity of between God, the Godhead, means that we're, it's all perfect. In fact, the unity that we have, he says, can be perfected. You see that in verse 23. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world will know you've sent me. I think there's an analogy here to think through uh, like a husband and wife on their wedding day. They are pronounced as one. They have to now live as one 
And as they walk out their marriage as one, they grow in this oneness, don't they? Become more unified, deeper in love and care and attention and affection. And so it is with the church. The, the, the more we step towards glory, the more we would step towards oneness with one another. This is what this means. Jesus is praying that there would be more on offer. Church, there's more on offer. There's more unity. There's more love. There's more joy. There's more effective witness. Then there's more believers. Then there's more glory. Then there's more unity. And there's more joy. And there's more love. All this is on offer. Jesus is praying that it would be the case through the church. That they be one, perfected in it. I wonder this morning, can you see the glory in oneness that Jesus is praying for with his people? Can you see the glory of it? Can you spot the glory with oneness with the fellow believers? Jesus is praying for it. Now, this oneness that he grants us isn't a kind of oneness that would just have us kind of sit in a circle, hold hands, and brim with joy. Um, Although I've never actually seen people do that. Um, Well, we've done it. We've sat in circles, but we're not just kind of sitting there brimming with joy. But there's an evangelistic edge and intention to the oneness that Jesus would create within his church. See, when you get a bunch of people who care deeply for something and who care deeply for one another, you have a compelling community. It might be sporting. It might be arts and crafts. It could be the music scene. Whatever it is, when you care deeply for a thing and you care deeply for one another, that's compelling. You can't miss it and you want to be in on it. That's the prayer Jesus is praying for the church. See that purpose spelt out. Look at verse 20. That they may be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me. And again, verse 23. I in them and you in me, that they may become one, perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. The oneness that we're gifted by Jesus is to be visible. This is what you might call the the, the church's public display of affection. Now, the PDA, the public display of affection, is not to be found in romantic tendencies, but it is to be kind of visible. You ought to be able to spot the way that the church is one. The kind of affectionate love and care and compassion we have for one another. God wants people to see the love that we speak about. This has always been the case for His people. So if you, if you kind of track through the story of the Bible, and Mark Dever and Jamie Dunlop's book, God's, uh, Com- Compelling Community, does this, you, you start to see the way that God has always designed that, that His people, there would be a witness that they would have that would be, make them effective for mission in the world. So Genesis 1, God's plan to glorify Himself isn't just with Adam and Eve, but it's that they would be fruitful, multiply, and subdue the earth. You'd have a people. His people would express the glory of God and expand the glory of God. Then when He's creating His special people, Israel, they're told to show His splendor to all the nations through the way they live their life together. It says, for what great nation is there that has a God so near to us as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon Him. So people were supposed to look at Israel and say, wow, your your God is close to you. The whole nation, you notice, is blamed in Ezekiel 36, 20, 21 for defaming His name among the nations. The whole people together are held responsible. Then when Jesus comes on the scene, a new people are going to witness Him. And as we heard back from John 13, 35, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Not just love for God, love for one another. That's going to help the witness and the mission. Then in Luke 2, you've got the, the acts of the church. And they're devoted to, to fellowship, the apostles' teaching, to the breaking of bread, the caring for one another's need. And what happened? And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. See, see God wants to make His love visible to the world. And he, he's, he's given the world a church. A global church expressed through local churches. They go on to say the local church is not evangelism. But the local church should be the power of evangelism. And I think that's the big idea. Friends, our, our effectiveness in mission will be connected to our effectiveness in loving one another. 
being united. Our oneness helps people realize that the Father sent the Son. Again, I think this means that that our unity has to start in in the revelation of who God is, true unity in who He is. People can't come to know who Jesus truly is if we share with them a different gospel message, right? If, If somehow we try and lower our doctrinal beliefs to a thinly veiled kind of, we all just want to get along together. All just getting along together doesn't get people to heaven. They need to believe the true gospel. So this true gospel, we must stick to unity in that. And then we get closer to one another because this gospel as saved by grace moves us out to love one another in grace. One way we help the word go out is by going closer to one another. A Greek writer named Lucian who lived from about the um, 120 to 200 AD, he said of the early Christians, it is incredible to see the fervor with which the people of that religion help each other in their wants. They spare nothing. Jesus has put it into their heads that they are brethren. That's what the Spirit does, right? He puts it into your head that you are brothers and sisters with fellow believers. And by being family, we look after family. The more unity we have, the more love we have, the more life that we can actually handle. Because the church is full of saved sinners, new saints figuring out how to follow Jesus. Church is going to be filled with what? Mistakes, difficult people, trying circumstances, hurt feelings. It's going to be filled with all these things. But the more unity you have and the more love you have, the more a church can handle. And I think, therefore, the opposite is also true then, isn't it? The less unity we have, the less love we have, the less we can handle. The less tension a church can have. Where little divisions that ought to be ripples become deep caverns or ravines where unity starts to deteriorate. And as a result, it diminishes its witness in the world. After all, if we're closing ourselves off to the people God brought us close to, are we not saying the message of the gospel is ineffective to a world? It harms our witness. So I think this means for us that we wouldn't want to work against Jesus' prayer here, would we? <laughs> you wouldn't want to work against Jesus' prayer. If his prayer is for oneness and his prayer is for witness, we wouldn't want to work against that. Where would we work against oneness? Where we work against oneness, sorry, we end up working against our witness. And to work against our witness is to work against people seeing the glory of Jesus. So I just wondered this morning, are you, are you aware of any ways that, that, you, that you work against the oneness that Jesus is praying for? Are you aware of of any ways where you're actually pushing against Jesus' petition of prayer? But he is wanting to bring you closer to the people of God in deeper unity. Are you aware of any of the ways that that's actually working against our corporate witness? Our gathered witness as the body of Christ. Jesus is praying that we be one for the glory of mission. Jesus is praying that we would be one with one another, lies he and the Father are one. As a church here at Kuma Baptist, we long for people would see Jesus. You know, we, we think this, this church is created by God. It's not created by us, it's created by God, and it's God's purposes. When, when uh, the, the director, Johnny Hughes, um, he directed David Attenborough's new film, A Life on Our Planet. And he was speaking about what's the impact he hopes it would have on people who see the film. And he said, I do hope that people will leave hopeful. See the film, leave hopeful. It made me think, well, when God creates a people for himself, and then he kind of shows that to the world, what's he hoping for? What kind of impact does he want? Well, he's hoping that these people 
would help the people in the world see Jesus more clearly. They would come to know that he is sent from the Father. Our oneness helps support the gospel message. It helps it stick. And so what would you expect if people come to Coomera Baptist? Uh, how, how might we show public display of affection for God's glory? If, they were to, if you're a visitor here today, here's what I hope you'd, as you look in on us, here's what I hope you'd see. By God's grace, we, you're going to see a bunch of saved sinners, people stumbling their way to glory, but here's what I hope you'd see. I hope you see diversity, different ages, different backgrounds, different preferences, music we like, sporting clubs we follow, hobbies we're interested in. But in that diversity, I hope you'd see unity. Gee, these, these guys all seem to believe the same message. Jesus is Lord, that He saves sinners, that there is hope uh, ahead of them. We'd hope you'd see that there's a love for one another, an increasing love, uh, not a perfect love, where we're, we're moving towards glory, but at least a, a love for one another. And I hope is as you look in, you would see that, oh, hang on a sec, this Jesus, this gospel thing is actually true because its grace is being worked out through the lives of these people. In fact, Jesus is praying that the world would know that these people are loved by the Father in the same way the Father loves the Son. Now, get your mind around this for a moment. What he's saying is the intensity and the commitment And the devotion that the Father loves the Son with. When you are walking in the oneness that Jesus is praying for, Jesus is saying the world's going to notice that the Father loves you, the church, in the same way they love the Son. Do you feel loved by the Father in the same way He loves the Son this morning? Because that's what Jesus is praying for. That's what His longing would be formed in His church throughout the ages. As they look around and they see this kind of unrestrained love, unhindered love, where does that love come from? As they hear stories of forgiveness, ways in which we've let each other down, but then we've been reconciled, they may ask, where does one learn to forgive like that? When they see the the closeness and the companionship between generations, they may wonder, what is it that brings all these people together? Well, it's the message of Jesus, isn't it? It's the message of Jesus. There's something compelling about the people of God supporting the message of the gospel. I was serving in a leadership conference once and I, I invited a friend um, who was running marketing for, for BMW uh, Brisbane to, to be in our team and help just advise for this event. And, and she came to the day and she helped execute some things and she was just she was kind of marveling the whole time of like, all these volunteers, you're saying all these people here are volunteers. I'm like, yeah, yeah, they're, they're, they're all paying, but these people here, yeah, they're all volunteers. She's like, they're doing it for free. I'm like, they're doing it for free. She's like, but they're so happy. And they're so willing to, to help out wherever. I'm like, yeah, they, yeah they've, been, they've been changed by the message of the gospel. She's baffled by it, amazed by it. Why? Because there's a, a unity, a oneness, a togetherness, a love between the people of God that helps support and validate the message that we're proclaiming, the message of the good news of Jesus. So there's the glory of oneness. It's founded upon the world the Word of God, the apostles' teaching. And then it flows out to witness the world would know that Jesus is sent by the Father. And all that brings it full circle, doesn't it? That these people would be brought together as one and then they would be seeing Jesus' glory one day. Look at verse 24. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. So just track with this for a moment. There's a glory that the Father gives to the Son, the revelation of who He is, and He is to give that to His disciples. Those disciples glorify God by receiving that revelation from Jesus and then announcing that revelation to the world. The world, those who... Our Christ, hear that revelation, receive that revelation, are united as one, and now go witness to others of that revelation, and so on and so on and so on, until we all get to see Jesus face to face in glory. This is going to go on, and we will see Him. That's Jesus' goal. That's His end 
play that everyone would be with him, all those who are his. Jesus said back in 12, 26, where I am, my own servant also will be. This is, his prayer is seeing this to be a reality. His promise, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you will also be where I am. This is his promise being answered through this prayer. I don't know if you've been invited to sit down at the table of, of, of an important meeting or be in the room with important people. Um, I don't know if I really have done that. I've been in the room with local counselors, with some like exciting. I was at a dinner table once where well, there was another dinner table over there, and that's where Miley Cyrus was, and, and it was very exciting. Or I've sat next to Brad Thorne once, um, who was a Reds coach, if you're into rugby union. I'm not. I just thought he was a huge human being. But, but, but being invited, but being able to sit, being in, being in the room, being in the place, being with the person of prominence is a privilege. Well, we have here the highest summit of the most important people, the Godhead. And he's, in, he's inviting, he's praying to the Father. I want them to come be at the table with me. See my glory. Charles Spurgeon recounts a story of one of his fellows at college. He says, Early the other morning there came to my bedside a brother to awaken me, whose face seemed to beam with joy as he said, In my sleep last night, I thought I saw the Lord upon his throne, and oh, the glory which the Father put upon him. I wish I could fall asleep again, that I might continue to dream on. The tears were in his eyes as he said, oh, the glory of Christ, oh, the glory of Christ. Happy are those, Spurgeon says, who sleeping or waking, living or dying, may but get a glimpse of his glory. Church, you long for that glory? Are you longing for that glory to see our Savior face to face? I don't know where you see yourself 10 years from now. Jesus wants to see you in heaven, soaking in his radiant presence, enjoying him, delighting in him. This is what Jesus is praying. His concern is for those who in the room, in this room, are going to call upon his name. Jesus' desire is that his people would make it to glory. His desire is beyond this room is for all those in the northern Gold Coast region who are his, all those in Australia, all those in the globe, that they would be his to see him. And I think, I think, the more we, we look to see that day and gaze upon that glory of Christ one day, I think that will stoke our hearts to love the people this, in this world a little deeper. Have you thought about that, picturing people beside you, looking at Jesus, that Jesus wants other Christians to be with him, seeing him? Can you picture perhaps a fellow brother in the faith who you feel tension with? Can you picture them being invited by Jesus to gaze upon the glory of God? Or can you picture the joy, parents, of seeing your children Standing before Jesus one day, there's many places that you may want them to be. There's a few places that you don't want them to be. Maybe you want them to end up happy working a nice job, ending up with a nice guy, ending up with a nice girl. More than that, would you want them to be with Jesus? Would you want them to see him in his presence? Young people. I don't know where you're at in life, but you may not be in the place in life where you want to be right now. But maybe you're not working the job you thought you would work or, you, or not the status that you've dreamed of, whatever it is. But take heart knowing that Jesus is praying that if you're in Christ, that you would be with him forever, whatever place you find yourself in now. Church, we may have wants here for where we'd like to see our church or the kind of place we'd like to be in as a church. But would we take heart? Jesus is praying for us. We would see him in glory one day. Not just the people here, but many others too. And that's Jesus' final words as he closes his prayer, isn't it? Praise, a, a kind of a, a vow to the Father that he's going to keep on making 
himself known, making the Father known to more people. See that in verse 25, O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name and will continue to make it known that the love which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Here's the hope we have for a sermon like this and a text like this this morning. It is so important we understand that this is first and foremost a prayer by Jesus before it is any kind of instructional application to us to go and be unified. See, one of the dangers we would have in a passage like this is to take Jesus' prayer and then somehow make it kind of conditional whether it will or won't happen. Do you see what I mean? As if somehow Jesus is praying and we're not sure if it's going to work out. As if unless we do everything we can, Jesus' prayer is not going to be answered. But I ask us a question this morning. Does Jesus get what he asks for? Does Jesus get what he asked the Father for? You better believe he gets it. His desire, his will that he will have a people for himself for all eternity. His desire and his will that he will have a people walking in oneness for the sake of witness to come in and see his glory one day. So church, take heart. His answer is yes. And we are here today because of Jesus' prayer got answered. The Spirit has been at work revealing the true message of the gospel through true churches proclaiming the gospel. We are one in Christ. The true church globally is one in Christ. We aren't divided. Yes, there may be different denominations and groups. That's okay. The true church, the global church is one because Jesus prayed that it would be one. Listening to a podcast of a pastor named Hashid Singh, who's, who's in India, working in northern India, and he's sharing stories of how the gospel is spreading. It's hard work. He was saying how some of his congregants are Uber drivers, and they leave little New Testaments on the dashboard, opportunities to evangelize. Or they'll have sermons playing in the car so people can hear the gospel and they can have conversations. Do you know why they're doing that? It's because Jesus' prayer got answered. The true revelation of the gospel reached into India, reached into this guy's life, reached into the lives of his congregation, now reaching out to the world. It is happening. They are one because they're united in the same message with the same Savior. We are one with them, the saints in India, the saints in Bangladesh, the saints from the 1300s, the saints in America, saints in small islands and the big islands. We share the same gospel message. We share the same Savior. We share the same mission. And we're going to see the same glory. So if Jesus' prayer is going to be answered, doesn't that encourage us today to work with Him? Move towards oneness for the sake of witness? If you're not a believer here today, can I encourage you, talk to, the, talk to Christians to the left and to the right of you. Ask them, why do they follow Jesus? What is it about him that's so compelling? We hope you can get a glimpse of it today in our worship and through our fellowship afterwards. Let our love be visible to outsiders so they may stand with us and gaze at our glorious Savior together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you answered your son's prayer.